The following is a production of the University of Minnesota. Um, yeah, you know, in my wildest dreams, I never thought I would be back giving a seminar after the last seminar I gave was on 33 years in extension and what all that was about and everything. And that was a lot of fun. And that was kind of like, adios, we'll see you later. And here we are back again, doing nothing with turf grass, as Eric alluded to, uh, but working on a project um, at the Rosemont Research and Outreach Center. That's a new initiative uh, for them and for sea fans um, called the Discovery Gardens. And there will be turf there. And actually, we're going to have really low maintenance turf. So all is not lost in, in the turf world. Um, I suspect if I wasn't there, there wouldn't be any turf. But because I'm there, there's at least some turf to walk on. Um, so I want to start out, first of all, with our <coughs> title, Discovery Gardens. This actually came about because of uh, a lot of master gardener work over about 10 years that evolved a rather large garden area that was directly across from the administration building in, at the Rosemont Research and Outreach Center. And they had done a really nice job of putting their gardens together and, and doing things there. They uh, had a number of faculty involved that they partnered with, uh, Jim Luby on his blueberries and uh, some woody plants. Uh, when both David Slesak and Kathy Zuzak uh, also had rose things going with them out there. So it, w it ended up being a very valuable project. Uh, we had lots of good attendance on their open houses, but with the advent of the changes that have been going on at Rosemont, now with gravel mining literally directly across the street from where this is, and an enormous increase in truck traffic, which has created noise issues, it's created safety issues, um, and in the summertime, <clears throat> as you might imagine, some dust issues, although I will say they have been pretty good about at least trying to control that. At the end of the day, that particular site isn't really very um, compatible with trying to do a lot of education. It's hard to hear. Uh, because there are no separate turnoffs for anybody uh, at that particular site, it, there's some issues around safety. And so we had an opportunity um, that came our way, sort of incidentally, but sort of by design, and that was our partners out there. Dakota County uh, is building, just building, they're not quite finished yet, they haven't had a grand opening, of their Whitetail Woods Regional Park. And that's actually to the south of the Umor property uh, that exists. And when I say Umor, that's University of Minnesota Outreach, Research, and Education Park, Umor Park. And it encompasses a grand total of about 5,200 acres. And we'll say more about how that's divided up here in just a second. But to make a long story short, um, there's a site that was located adjacent to uh, a road that actually cuts through our property, that is the University of Minnesota property, to get to their park, which is sort of strategically positioned with some nice topography that um, of all the places we could put an interesting area for some public gardens that would encompass natural resources as well as horticulture, as well as some agriculture things that we hope to do, and I'll say more about that a little bit later. But that's kind of how we went from an existing horticulture program uh, to one that's significantly more expanded, um, although you'll find out a little bit later that this is still a relatively small scale compared to a lot of uh, public gardens that are around. The name Discovery Gardens uh, happens because <clears throat> our University of Minnesota tagline is driven to discover. And what we wanted to do at this park that was unique and very appropriate for a research and outreach center was to focus on research in a variety of ways, i.e. discovery in a variety of ways that would bring to the public, to the region, to that area, uh, a variety of ways that the university 
is involved with and interacting with horticulture that everyone or most everyone can relate to, whether they have trees, a food garden, flower gardens, maybe a restored prairie or woodland that they're working on. Uh, all of this uh, will be encompassed in that and all sort of around discovery. And we'll say more about that just a little bit later. So let's get to number one here. And that's this area here. This is actually the park road that cuts through uh, university property. This is university property here and over here. And this is the park road that's just completed last October, so you could at least drive on it. And our design, that, and you'll see, you'll notice up here that we've been working with the Kestrel Design Group, uh, Peter McDonough and others, to develop um, a public garden that just sort of lays into this landscape um, in a very compatible sort of way. And we'll talk about its uses in a minute. This is a connecting road. Uh, this is the parking lot. There's an area right underneath the R and the A here that's actually a farmstead shelter, which is more like an open pavilion. Um, from the way the, in, the language and the legislation uh, has been interpreted, and I'll say more about that because this is actually on what will ultimately be DNR property called Vermilion Highlands. But nonetheless, I'll get back to that. This area here is kind of the central gathering area. And this in here, which you'll see a little later, is called the core garden area, which is the centralized outreach, research, and education area or garden. And it's in this area that we envision a lot of our uh, education, our classes, our demonstrations will take place for people to both engage in actively as well as in a more passive way. There's a little amphitheater here, and we'll come back to some of these other features a little bit later. But this is kind of the general layout. Much of this area that's labeled, it's a little hard for you to see, is restored prairie. Uh, one of the interesting things about this site is we have an opportunity with an existing woodland that's in pretty bad shape to do some restoration work here, and also in a rather large area of about six acres of restored prairie, that is currently moist, mostly soybean fields. And so we've been working with the DNR um, on that uh, to help us with getting that done come this spring. Okay, so the leadership for this really comes from CFANS, and that's how I'm gonna refer to the College of Food, Ag, and Natural Resource Sciences from now on uh, for the presentation. The faculty and staff at the Rosemont Research and Outreach Center and the Kestrel Design Group. The location, as I mentioned, is in Umore Park, but there's this unique area called Vermilion Highlands. The Vermilion Highlands, of which this is part of, was about 2,500 acres that was sold by the university to the DNR, um, and the DNR would ultimately take full ownership of that 25 years from that sale, which is now about five years ago, but the money the university received from that helped us, build, helped us to build a new stadium. So of the 7,800 or so acres that was out here originally, uh, there's still about 5,200 plus or minus acres that are still under uh, the university's uh, control in one fashion or another. But that area that is sold to the DNR has since become Vermilion Highlands, and it's actually referred to that in the legislation that actually uh, established that course of action. Okay, so we're gonna kinda go around this loop a little bit, and Prezi is new to me as well, so if things happen that um, look like gremlins, they're gremlins. There's no operator error here today, so anyway. The mission of this particular project um, is to be a horticultural and natural resource learning landscape. You'll notice that we specifically didn't use the term garden because garden can mean something very specific to lots of different folks. It can be a flower garden, can be an herb garden, can be a vegetable garden. And we actually envision this entire area to have some traditional kinds of gardens, but the whole area is really a learning landscape. Uh, and we'll say more about that uh, when we talk about discovery here in just a minute. 
Uh, it's for the community. It's for volunteers within the university, like master gardeners, master naturalists. Um, and hopefully, we'll be encouraging and inspiring for folks who come to this to both come or come discover and adopt. So what exactly do we mean by those three terms? Well, first of all, come is an invitation to come to this rather large, uh, sometimes ominous, sometimes onerous appearing land. Uh, that original land was part of uh, the US military uh, land that they uh, took literally back in about 1942 or so um, to build a munitions plant here called the Gopher Ordnance Works. And they, there were train tracks, there were all sorts of things that came in here. It was a very large facility built in anticipation that World War II was going to continue for who knew how long. It turns out that the war ended, thankfully, before there was any substantial amount of munitions uh, that had left this plant. And so at that time, the United States military uh, sold it to the university, sold this entire property uh, back to the university for a dollar. There were some of the original farmers who did purchase their land back. That was an option. Uh, but as you might imagine, folks needed to make a living and whatnot, and so many of them who had farms moved on to other areas, moved out of the area to someplace else or whatever. So we were left with about 7,800 acres, 7,900 acres uh, in its entirety, and that's the origination of much of the Rosemont Research and Outreach Center and all of the different parts. There's the real estate office at the University of Minnesota, that has about 2,500 of those acres or so, maybe about 3,000, that they rent to a variety of different folks, some for farming, some for manufacturing, and some for uh, as varied uses as places for the St. Paul bomb squad to actually explode um, bombs. Okay, so that's kind of the nature of the entire land. And that's a little bit about what we mean by come. We hope to make that an opportunity for folks to both come and discover the general site, to explore what's there. Uh, but we have every intention of trying in some way to honor that history uh, of the site uh, as we integrate that into our uh, landscape design and our planting and so on. The term discover uh, comes really what we view in three parts. First of all, uh, discover uh, the diversity of learning opportunities that are there. It's kind of discover about the site, and this is kind of from a consumer's perspective. Um, what's new in horticultural and natural resource research, such as we're able to do those things there. Uh, and it's really an attempt, again, to showcase a lot of things that are happening and going on um, in university research that are related to plants. Um, everything from phytochemicals to new applications for other products, you name it. Of course, hardiness is going to be one of those as well. And the third discovery is really at that consumer level where they can see how uh, research has been adapted um, and utilized in a landscape kind of setting, in a learning landscape, that they can literally take home and put in their yard. And it can be everything from, uh, let's just take an example, let's say, of a pollinator garden. And knowing what plants are both hardy, they're drought tolerant, but they're also good for encouraging butterflies and pollinators, if that's something they want. We expect that there will be opportunity for folks to, uh, at least those who are more tech savvy, uh, use things like QR boxes that can connect them directly to the plant material, whatever design was used there, such that they can literally take their phone or whatever they have uh, and go to a Gertens or a Bachman's or someplace uh, of a nursery that's close by and literally replicate that in their backyard. On the way other end of the spectrum, for those who are much more comfortable with being able to 
grab a piece of, of literature, a folder, or a flyer that has the same thing on it. They too, if they're interested, can replicate that particular planting or that particular design or that particular idea uh, right into their home landscape. We also expect that uh, between these two things, we also hope to show folks some things about what not to do. Um, in our setting here, it's okay to fail. And so we might actually have a planting where someone, and I'll pick on blueberries, puts them in a terrible soil, way high pH, and the plants turn yellow, as opposed to the proper preparation of soil to grow blueberries, even if you only have a couple plants, or maybe a larger garden area. But sometimes it really helps to be able to show people what doesn't work, so they envision in their mind when things maybe start to go awry, uh, they have some notion of, oh yeah, I saw that at the Discovery Gardens, and yeah, this is what it was from. Now, that's a pretty superficial diagnostic work, but it may get them on the right track. So we hope to do some things uh, there um, that will give us an opportunity to show folks the also what not to do. Um, and of course, the last part of this is a direct outgrowth from here, which we just talked about and that's the adoption uh, to people's, their own landscapes. I'll just take a couple minutes and um, talk a little bit about what we think this learning landscape is not. Sometimes that's really helpful in trying to frame uh, what we think we are. And we'll start out, we're not an arboretum or a botanical garden, at least in the sort of general sense that we think about them. Um, it is not really the goal of the Discovery Gardens to be a center for plant collection or preserving uh, germplasm or uh, other things that are more of a collection kind of thing. That doesn't mean we may not have gardens of pollinators, uh, for example, but we're not going to have a hosta collection or a daylily collection. We intend to use the plants in a variety of landscapes so people can come and learn how to use those plants um, in a landscape kind of setting. Um, we don't need to repeat other things that our own Minnesota Landscape Arboretum does. In fact, we hope that we can find ways to be complementary, uh, both in supporting their mission and vision, but also uh, perhaps, perhaps promoting uh, similar kinds of programs. It's not a recreational park. You're not going to be able to show up and Unless you like playing frisbee golf in the middle of a prairie, um, there's probably not going to be places to exactly do that in this landscape. Um, and for example, Dakota County's Whitetail Woods Regional Park, as I mentioned, is directly south and a little west uh, of our Discovery Gardens. And there's all kinds of opportunities for recreation. So there was absolutely no point in us thinking about or pursuing things uh, that would compete with that because we certainly don't need to uh, in this instance. This is about a learning uh, landscape kind of setting for folks. And at least out of the starting gate, um, there's not a user fee uh, based um, admission fee or anything like that that's going to be uh, present. In other words, we want the public to come it's open for their perusal, for their learning, for their studying, for whatever they want to do. Uh, at some point down the road, if there's interest in someone having a wedding there, or who knows what the situation, it may be that fees will be considered for some of those kind of events. But as a general admission sort of premise, um, it's not a, a fee-based system, at least at this point. So a little bit about then what we are. Um, with those things that we're kind of not, we hope these gardens are engaging and interactive uh, with the public as they go through these various kinds of learning landscapes that they encounter. It's a good opportunity for us to demonstrate Minnesota hardy plants and best practices, whether it relates to natural resources or to the use of hardy plants in the landscape. Um, and we may plant some things that are advertised to be hardy, like peaches, and show that, you know, maybe that's not so much of a good idea for Minnesota. 
uh, or other things. I mean, we could have picked on a lot of other things that get sold at garden centers, big box places, all under the premise that, yeah, they're fine for Minnesota, when in fact they may not be. Uh, the kind of fun one here is to address current issues and topics that are focused on sustainability. Um, a lot of times we uh, see claims about um, a particular grass or particular flowers or particular trees that do superbly. They have all this wonderful kind of resistance or whatever it happens to be. And we hope that there's an opportunity and this is where we want to work with master gardeners to test some of those claims. Uh, there's a section that I'll talk about in a minute that's actually labeled as the Discovery Lab part of our core garden area that uh, is going to be devoted just to those kind of things. We're master gardeners and we'll work with them to set up projects uh, to help evaluate and to show people uh, what works, what doesn't, and in some cases where the claims are valid you know, so be it. That'll be a, a good illustration of, of things to do in that setting. It is an open and accessible to both natural areas as well as restored natural areas. Uh, we're excited about the opportunities we have with some of the master naturalist folks um, working with us in helping restore the prairie, but also that small woodland area that I showed you at the beginning. And of course, as I've already mentioned a couple, uh, we hope to involve a lot of different volunteer groups uh, in this particular setting, whether they're university volunteer groups, uh, perhaps scouts, perhaps a whole variety of, of different uh, folks that are out there, garden clubs certainly too. Okay, some of the natural features, um, as, you, as I pointed out initially, this has some varied and interesting topography. It's not just flat. Um, it does sit down kind of there's if you look at the area and it's hard to visualize this is all a downslope that comes uh, to this general area just back from a little way so it creates kind of a natural bowl for this um, and of course the question I know everybody's asking well isn't that going to be a frost pocket and potentially there may be some of that but we also have good air drainage to the uh, to the north and west from this site that actually both water and air can drain down to a much lower uh, wetland uh, boggy area and so we where this is positioned in the landscape um, at least so far we don't have a lot of concern for uh, creating issues from that standpoint um, this is the little woodland area we talked about uh, there's some surrounding area here where we'll introduce um, some of the white oaks and bur oaks in particular uh, to help restore a, a savanna area. And this is kind of a placeholder. This, this area here sits just outside of this general area, a stormwater detention uh, basin, which is normally going to be dry. Uh, and right now we're working uh, with Kestrel and some of our own internal hydrology folks uh, to work out a plan for how to move water around this site that's very much uh, natural based. Modifying the existing landforms to be able to uh, use stepped kind of rain gardens or a variety of other features. Um, and partly not because they're necessarily something adaptable to a homeowner's property, at least at that scale, but we also hope to entice folks that are with parks or with cities that are wondering similar kinds of questions about, you know, what can we do? We, we can't afford to put in a big storm sewer pipe, uh, but we can modify the land and how might we do that? And so this is again a situation where we can do that and what we've talked with Kestrel about is, you know, let's, I think we can design this in a way that um, we avoid catastrophic events, but if there are some features that we want to try or that might be researchable, um, and if they fail, that's good. That's a learning experience as long as we don't wash out the whole area, which we don't anticipate happening, um, you know, at all right at this point. Okay, the sea fans, uh, discovery gardens again, uh, some of the structural features. This is the whitetail woods. Uh, road. There will be an entryway sign here, a rather large sign, 
Um, in fact, Dakota County has asked, well, how large are you going to make it? And we've said just enough so they, just big enough so they can't see the Whitetail Woods Regional Park sign. Other than that, we don't have to make it any bigger. So, but anyway, there will be clearly a landmark there identifying this area. This actually goes up to a very steep slope. And interestingly enough, as you come around the curve to the top of this slope, you literally will have a bird's eye view down into uh, the entire garden area uh, from that vantage point. As I mentioned before, this is our farmstead shelter. That's kind of a gathering area for uh, activities, for meeting people, uh, classes. Uh, and this is also the area where we uh, hope to do some things with our ode to agriculture uh, from the area. Maybe it's crops that were grown earlier, maybe they're heirloom kinds of things. And by agriculture, we don't necessarily just mean row crop agriculture, but agriculture in the broad sense that would include some of the horticulture crops as well. We then go from the parking lot uh, through this area, and this is over to our core garden uh, area here. And there's, these will be pathways that will all be ADA accessible. This little amphitheater over here is really a name that we've tagged on to our outdoor learning classroom, a little larger uh, classroom area that will in fact have amphitheater characteristics. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily think of it as an area where there's going to be band concerts and everything, at least maybe not initially, uh, for sure. But at any rate, it is an area that because of the slope of the area behind this, it's a very natural sort of easy slope for folks um, to sit or watch or do whatever uh, they want to do for different events that might be held here. There's also a variety of different learning nodes that are stationed through here so that classes can occur either on a little larger scale that might be under the farmstead shelter or perhaps over here. There's a lot of individual learning stations, if you will, for master gardeners to maybe do something on pruning, uh, deadheading uh, in a perennial garden, working with pollinators, uh, pollinator plants, arranging them, getting them organized into a garden, how, whatever the topic may be. And this is just one idea of a uh, farmstead structure. Um, as we interpret the law right now, um, and that's, there's some subject to uh, nuances there, it depends on who you talk to, but uh, the original legislation was believed to uh, create a situation where there could not be um, heated and plumbed buildings, much like you would think of the visitor center at any county park or perhaps the Arboretum building or something like that. Um, so for now, we're assuming that that's the correct interpretation. Um, so we're looking at um, doing a pavilion type of structure um, where people can gather under. If you need kind of an idea of what that might be, uh, the Ordway Picnic Shelter at the Arboretum might be something like what we would propose here. And again, it would have more of a farm flavor, uh, kind of as, again, sort of a, a historical, uh, I won't say tribute, but a historical acknowledgement of agriculture in that area. Some of the core educational features Again, we talked about the amphitheater. There will be a central gazebo. Again, this is a smaller area for people to gather. Um, there are four distinct quadrants, just because you can divide this area into four quarters. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, and then larger research and educational plots, which exist around to the outside uh, of this area. And again, they could be varied in nature. But these four quadrants are sectored in such a way that the emphasis both internally in this core area and to the outside will focus on the urban oasis, and in particular the urban landscape oasis, uh, sustainable landscapes and practices for our urban and suburban sites. And we could be more broadly and, and talk about even just home sites in towns and townships uh, around the state uh, as well. It doesn't have to be 
Minneapolis or St. Paul or, or Bloomington or whatever. It can, it'll be suitable for lots of different uh, places. And this is the Discovery Lab. Uh, investigations into current topics, claims, questions, and issues. Some of those smaller projects will be in here. Um, areas that require a little more space for some things uh, will be in this general area. Continuing around the Food for Life, this is an area that will actually have a little larger learning node. Um, gardens planted out here, and that can be everything from trying companion planting to vertical gardening to how to lay out a community garden because Whitetail Woods will have a community garden area. And one of the things that we see as overlapping in education is to provide uh, the information for folks on how to do that um, correctly and efficiently and use good practices. And then the wild side is this quadrant which actually walks off to a uh, trail that will be alongside the woodland where we want to restore that woodland edge and be able to um, incorporate things that are good for attracting birds um, and just how to maintain an edge, invasive species kind of work, all of that sort of thing uh, will fit along here uh, as well as the prairie and that ultimately leads out um, to the prairie. Okay, so this is the last one of the slides for this. So who's involved? Um, ultimately, we hope CFAN's faculty and staff, including those uh, at the Rosemont Research and Outreach Center, uh, extension faculty and staff, either uh, with master gardeners or perhaps master naturalists, or by themselves as Kathy and Dave have done with their roses in the past. Um, U of M volunteer groups, we've mentioned those already, and community businesses and organizations. Whether that takes the form of sponsorships or whether it takes the form of cooperating with other groups, it can be any number of different things uh, that will fit uh, in that particular arena. Well, let's continue on so I allow enough time. You're here, what, what was it, six o'clock we're done? All right, no. No, maybe not that long. <laughs> you won't be here and I won't be here, I suspect. Okay, so this is just a little closer look. Um, I have a few other slides. Uh, just kind of um, focusing in a little bit more on intentions of projects and things that we hope to uh, be able to do. Again, this is the parking lot, our farmstead shelter. Uh, if you could read this little green area up here. Um, if you were to look at it, you would say, well, it says vineyard and we actually pronounce it vineyard because one of the things that's going to sort of backdrop the amphitheater um, is an idea that we've kind of liked that's been shared is to use a series of trellises and focus in on all the different kinds of plants that do well on trellis kinds of systems and create them and arrange them in such a way that it's actually a little bit of a maze or something that kids can either walk through or, or whatever the case. But again, the it's really about the education of different kinds of materials adapted to um, vines. And we might include things like some of the hops and focus a little bit on the research. Certainly grapes would fall into that category. Uh, but it can also be some of our more ornamental plants uh, as well. So um, features. Gardens and information on choosing and growing Minnesota hardy fruits. Um, there are reasons why Minnesota has been a leader in developing hardy plants and hardy fruits for this area. And we want to be able to have an exhibit garden or a feature garden uh, that will in fact be uh, information about the fruit breeding here in Minnesota. It could be blueberries. One might be on some of the apples, a variety of different things uh, for people to learn about. And again, these will be uh, locations where there might be a QR box that connects folks to more research information, not research in the sense of data and whatnot, but research in terms of what goes on here. Uh, we also uh, hope to continue the flower trials that the master gardeners had established at the other site. Uh, we continue to do those on a limited basis in the garden area that's now in transition. 
uh, but we do hope to be able to uh, carry those forward. Uh, plant evaluation is something that's always been an important part of research and outreach centers, and this is a good opportunity to link back to uh, the Master Gardener program as well as to show the public uh, about new and upcoming varieties that, that they can be looking for, and they can see for themselves whether there's good disease resistance or not. Uh, landscape settings and information about selecting and using hardy trees and shrubs. Again, we're not really into plant collection business, but really more about how do we use small trees in the landscape? How do we use large trees in a landscape? Uh, hardy shrubs and how best to use them in a landscape. So it's really about ideas and ways to do things that, again, people can, under that adopt mode, take home and incorporate into their own landscape and do it in a way so they're not planting uh, silver maples in a 20 by 20 area in front of their Minneapolis home, but be able to choose plants that are suitable and will continue to be suitable even after they've reached uh, maturity. Uh, landscape areas, both large and small, that are planned for attracting birds, butterflies, and other pollinator species. This is a little bit from the butterfly garden that had been at this site. Right now, that is still present, and we will be moving some of the plants from there uh, as we have places for them and projects for them at the other site. Uh, a little bit on our vegetable variety trials. Again, the master gardeners have been involved with a variety of those. They have moved off-site for these past two years, but we hope to bring them back in a way that uh, uh, will we'll work at our new discovery gardens. And they typically have been about either growing methods, uh, different cultivars, and a variety of different things uh, that we hope to, again, bring back for interest. Home landscape designs that uh, do on-site water conservation such as rain gardens, they can be stepped rain gardens, they can be something like this that's adaptable to a home setting. As I mentioned earlier, as we think about our larger stormwater management plan um, and being able to do that with some landform changes, uh, we hope to be able to have this adaptable or of interest uh, not only to consumers but on a larger scale to parks and municipalities, uh, businesses perhaps, and other organizations. Uh, sustainable landscapes, what can we do in terms of choosing hardy plants, drought tolerant plants, uh, plants that are going to uh, not require as many resource inputs as we look to uh, conserve both natural resources as well as our own individual family resources of money and time and how do we do that but still do it in a way that it looks planned. Uh, some of you re may remember that um, Joe Nassauer, who was here many years ago, um, talked about cues to care. And part of a more natural sort of landscape, which everybody's fear is this is just going to become a brush pile in the neighborhood, um, her position was, no, it doesn't have to be. We can do things uh, deliberately and intentionally that create a sense that even though there are lots of natural plants and natural forms growing there, it's not neglected. And part of our way of, of utilizing these gardens is to have some examples of what people can do in uh, particularly smaller landscapes where they may not even think that that's possible. Okay, so this is, this is the site. It is a very raw site at the moment. This was taken last fall. Um, we are looking east to west, actually kind of southeast to northwest. Uh, this large area of sumac uh, has actually been now removed, or, well, it's been treated, it hasn't been dug out, um, and actually moved uh, or opened up this area so that the, the large core area will end up being kind of in this vicinity. <coughs> um, earlier this past summer in 2013, um, this is probably about August where the road was just being staked and cleared for the park road. And this side is an area that's not actually part of our uh, Discovery Gardens area. This area to the northeast of this road that comes through here 
is actually the far west edge of our discovery garden partly where the road will be coming in and this is just another look at that the general area is way back up in here our farmstead shelter would be envisioned about here parking lot and access road uh, ultimately off in this area uh, here again you can kind of I'm just kind of showing you some pictures of what this site is about this is looking northwest excuse me northeast to southwest um, again this area of sumac is no longer there uh, the amphitheater would probably be about in this area and um, again you can't really see it but this opens up enough here so that it's flat enough that we can actually do some interesting gardening things there as well. This is actually the Whitetail Woods boundary, um, which is mostly a fence line of Jerusalem artichoke and prickly ash. Um, but it serves the purpose in terms of uh, running back and forth. There is a barbed wire fence too, uh, but this is going to be our general area over here. So you can see we are directly adjacent to this. This is going to be a large recreational park area. And again, what we're hoping to do with the sign sort of blocking, no, we're not really going to do that. But um, our sign, hopefully, we hope one of two things happen. Either the kids drop off the parents to go play here and they come back to the garden, or vice versa, the parents drop the kids off in the park and they come back to the garden. We're not exactly sure which way that's going to happen, but. Um, Nonetheless, the opportunities will be there for them to do that. This is the new park road. It's not paved. It's just a hardened uh, gravel surfaced road. Again, this just kind of gives you an idea of where we're at. This area up here is actually the very top part of the slope, which is still in the Discovery Garden. It's part of the restored prairie. Um, we call it Overlook Ridge, and there are actually going to be three or four stopping points along the way where we can talk about um, plants that might have been in prairie areas like this um, all the way back to pre-settlement what it might have been just before the, the war and the acquisition of the land with the US military um, and so there will be a number of educational features associated with them um, if you don't feel like learning anything you can just stare off into the horizon because you can if you look to the east from up here, you can clearly see into Wisconsin. If you look to the south, I was going to say you can see Des Moines, but actually probably not. Northfield's probably closer. <laughs> You're probably not even that far, but you can see a long way, and it's a ma really a magnificent vista. Uh, if you go back and look this way, you will look into the parkland and ultimately into a very large stand of red pine and white pine. Uh, that's on park property that they've maintained uh, for part of their park interest. Uh, this is kind of an example. This is actually from Shars Bluff, but it's an example of a mowed trail similar to what we would envision in our restored prairie area and perhaps some of the restoration work we might do in our, in our savanna area. So I just thought this was a good picture of sort of giving you an image of what that trail through there might look like. This is a little bit about the proposed amphitheater. You can see the slope area here. Um, the platform or amphitheater base, if you want to call it that, would be about here. And this natural slope allows us to create some very natural terracing without having to do a lot of recreation with earth moving and large equipment and so on. And I'm actually standing just about on the Whitetail Woods Regional Park line, looking almost due north uh, into the site. And this is what it looked like as of November 2013. Um, the sumac removed, and this, this whole area in through here is all part of that sort of core garden area, what we envision to be our core garden area uh, for this park. And that leaves about 10 minutes or whenever you folks are, are done. Questions? Um, that's a lot of stuff. It's sort of quick and dirty. Um, where we are at this instant in time is we have the concept plans back from Kestrel as of last uh, September. Uh, some of the preliminary survey work has been done to sort of 
verify the topography and it actually turns out there were parts on the old base maps that were significantly off so we now have an accurate topography map we've done soil borings to determine a little bit about the nature and properties of the soils that exist in the area where construction is going to occur um, that all occurred last november early december uh, in january um, we began working with uh, kestrel again to give us some cost uh, kinds of analysis and we're right now in the process of getting that synthesized and thinking about and figuring out um, uh, where we can go with that uh, money needs and so on so we're we're right at the at the cusp of of going from paper to land uh, but as you might imagine within uh, the university there's all sorts of t's to cross and i's to dot um, before we can actually uh, do that. 